Welcome back to the Atal FDB on Data Science, organized by Department of Computer Science and Engineering, B.S. Abdul Rahman, Crescent Institute of Science and Technology. I would like to introduce the guest speaker of this session, Mr. Dilip Muridharan, Senior Technical Instructor, Splunk Chennai. He is an education consultant with a total of 18 plus years of experience in the IT industry, with 12 years of experience in consulting, designing, customizing, and delivering technical training on enterprises IT software platforms. He is experienced in working with customers across APAC, North America and EMEA with a proven track of record of developing, selling, delivering education solutions to custom fit the client partners requirement. He has proven delivery methods with extensive travel across Southeast Asia, Greater China and India. To mention few of his specialities are seasoned instructor for classroom training, online web-based training, and e-learning development. He is experienced in business development, selling, and upselling education services. He has also proven solutions architect for educational en enablement of technical and end users. He is experienced in delivering technical training in a classroom, online setup, and building e-learning solutions on a variety of product platforms from companies like ArcServe, JDA, and EMC. He is good in the technical aspects of Windows, Unix servers, Active Directory, networking, web servers, databases, scripting, and basic code. Once again, on behalf of the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, I welcome you, sir. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Am I audible to yes. everybody in the session? Yes, sir. Is my audio loud and clear? Excellent. All right. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Um, so today's session, uh, we're going to be talking about big data analytics. Um, but before getting started with the session, um, a big thank you to a number of people who were responsible for putting together this session. Uh, most importantly, the teaching, non-teaching staff, and the management, and the participants uh, who've helped put together this session, and also to ICT Academy for having um, leveraged their resources to make this happen. Um, before getting started uh, with the actual agenda, uh, I would like to quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dilip. I am a senior technical instructor with a company called Splunk. Um, Splunk is uh, the world's largest leading big data analytics platform at this point in time. So we primarily work on big data analytics, um, on data science specifically, in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, we primarily operate in the security space. So anything that has to do with machine generated data on the security space, uh, you would find something pertaining to Splunk being available there, right? Um, I come uh, with about 18 years, close to 18 years worth of experience in the industry out of which 12 have been in the education and consulting business. I work for a bunch of different companies. I work for Trimble Navigation, where I've done uh, GPS-based fleet management support. Uh, I work for Convergys, where I supported Microsoft products, Windows Server, Windows XP, and Microsoft SharePoint systems, and BizTalk Server. And uh, I work with Computer Associates, where I've had a heavy uh, storage and recovery management uh, profile. So I've been in the support profile when it comes to uh, backup and recovery software, high availability, hardware and software-based clusters, storage area networks, and so on and so forth. And uh, I finally moved to EMC way back in 2008. And uh, I switched over from a support-based profile to an education and consulting based profile, and I haven't looked back ever since. Um, I was a instructor and a consultant, education consultant for 
the enterprise content management business with EMC. I was with EMC for about five years, left EMC for JDA software, and then actually came back to work for EMC as a principal instructor. And four years ago, I moved to Splunk and uh, I'm at Splunk at this point in time. So that's a short synopsis of who I am, where I come from, and what exactly is my uh, career history. So today, I would like to facilitate this discussion on big data analytics. I'd like to keep things short and simple. So we're going to do a quick 90 minute session. I'm going to try and speak for nothing more than 70 minutes. And I would like to reserve the last 20 minutes for Q&A. So uh, as a question on chat, your email address, please. Uh, I'll give you my email contact information at the end of the session, so you will have that information published um, in the presentation. Uh, so like I said, I'll try to talk for nothing more than 70 minutes. In fact, what I'll try and do is I'll try and set up a countdown timer for 71 minutes and uh, minimize that and keep that so that we don't go over time. So. What I would like to do is this. I'd like to start off with the subject of discussing big data analytics. We'll then talk about some of the use cases for big data analytics. And then we'll specifically talk about job opportunities in tech, right? Specifically from the point of view of big data analytics, right? And we'll try and discuss that so that uh, you as faculty will be able to facilitate and guide your students and groom them towards a career uh, in any of the data analytics opportunities that are available out there. Now, I believe in making a presentation um, with a demo of how things work. If I'm not able to demonstrate a particular piece of technology, I don't speak on that technology at all anywhere in any forum. In line with that philosophy, I do have a couple of demos here for you. Uh, specifically, I have two, two different demos on two different use cases here for you. So I'll try and showcase two different demos. One will be a demo on the basis of online sales data. The other one will probably be something along the lines of corporate network data. So we'll try and see how big data analytics as a platform uh, allows us to do a lot with very less, right? Now, um, what I would also like to make very, very clear at the very on start is that uh, I am a subject matter expert on Splunk. So all the demos that I am going to show you today, they're all going to be on the basis of the Splunk enterprise platform. Having said that, um, Splunk isn't the only big data analytics tool out there. Uh, there's plenty of other tools out there. And you could, you know, probably go ahead and do pretty much everything that I'm doing today with any other tool that you might be familiar with. Uh, but I would say uh, from an ease of use perspective uh, and from a time to resolution perspective, Splunk is probably the most easiest and the fastest way to get there, um, which kind of explains why, you know, uh, Splunk is one of the leading platforms out there at this point in time. So without any further delay, let's get into the actual agenda for the day, right? Let's talk about big data, right? So what exactly is big data? What I'd like to do is Instead of looking at these slides and discussing theory, uh, let's actually go ahead and investigate what big data is, right? But before I go ahead and do that, I'd like to take some comments from the audience. I'd like to know from the audience, uh, what do you think big data is? What is in your opinion or in your experience or in your understanding, right? What exactly is big data? What do you understand by big data? Can anyone comment? Answers can go in the chat window, or you can also unmute and speak up. Either of those are comfortable with me. What do you understand by big data? 
I'm not looking for right answers. I'm looking for ideas so that I can gauge the metric of where the audience is and uh, facilitate the conversation. Participants are posting in chat, sir. All right. So um, there's a bunch of suggestions on chat. So let's go ahead and analyze them one by one. Right. Um, big data is larger uh, uh, because there are a lot of comments. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if I would be able to read out all of your names. So apologies if I don't have time, the bandwidth to read out your names. I'm merely going to read out the comment, the content. So let's go ahead and read all this commentary here, right? Big data is large set of structured or semi structured data, large amount, high speed, unstructured. Uh, 5V, I'm not sure of what 5V is. Uh, big data is, for example, YouTube users' data, social media data. It's larger, more complex data sets, huge collection of data, huge volume of data, high speed, unstructured. Um, 5V volume, velocity, heterogeneous data, raw materials or raw facts of the surrounding call data. It's referred by volume, velocity, veracity, and variety of data. Okay, all right, that's an interesting definition out there. Uh, it's data collected from multiple sources. Cool, okay, all right. So we've got enough comments out here. Right, so let's work with these comments, right? Let's work with this commentary and see what exactly is big data. Now, like I said, I'd like to keep things short and simple. So in line with that philosophy, I'm going to open up Wikipedia, right? Big data. I'm going to go to Wikipedia and I'm going to try and see what Wikipedia thinks is big data, right? So if you look at the Wikipedia definition of big data, what exactly does Wikipedia say? Wikipedia says that big data is nothing but big data is a field where uh, we analyze and extract information from otherwise, you know, deal with data sets that are too large or too complex to be dealt with by traditional data processing application software. So that seems to be the emphasis right there, right? So, you know, traditional data processing application software. So that's essentially what it says, right? So question, what exactly do we mean by traditional data processing application software? Can someone give me examples of traditional data processing application software. What are some of the examples when it comes to traditional Oracle, COBOL, MySQL, ERP? Okay, so there's a bunch of comments out here on what traditional Postgres, okay, relational database processing, okay. What else, any other ideas? Excel, okay, uh, Excel definitely is a traditional data processing application platform. Cognos, um, okay, I'm not sure what Cognos is. I haven't come across it, apologies if I'm not aware. File processing using programming language. Okay, so we've got enough examples out there, right? So from Wikipedia, right, what is the general definition that we've understood? We understand that big data can be very, very large and voluminous in nature. So that's one of the fundamental behavioral traits of large voluminous data. Right. So hang on a second, though, but that's not a really accurate, you know, depiction. Uh, that's not a really accurate representation of what exactly big data is, because at the end of the day, I am pretty sure that there is plenty of voluminous data available out there. But not all of it can actually be presented, right? Uh, can be argued as big data. So what else are the, you know, characteristics of big data? Well, this data could be structured and it could be unstructured. So 
someone also, I think a few people also in the chat window mentioned that, you know, um, that uh, the data could be structured or it could be unstructured. A lot of unstructured comments came into the picture here. Right. So fair enough, right? Those are all good examples for big data. So again, question time. What do you understand by the difference between structured data and unstructured data? What do you think is the difference? Comments go in the chat window. What's the difference between structured data and unstructured data? I believe someone has their microphone open. If you could check your microphones and mute, I would uh, appreciate it. There's some background noise from someone's open microphone. Hello, sir. Uh, hello, yes. Structure data and structure, yeah. So structure is organized data, which can be arranged like a table format and like this, we can say it is arrangeable data. Unstructured data, which are different format, we can say it is like a PDF, image, audio. So together that we can say it is unstructured data, right? Like Facebook data, we can upload and text it, etc. Yeah, so. Okay, all right, excellent. That's yeah. that's actually a very good definition. Okay, someone says in the chat window, XML, JSON is unstructured data. That's actually not true. XML and JSON are excellent examples for structured data. So they have a definitive structure. There's a schema, there's a proper schema. XMLs do have a schema. JSON does have a schema. So uh, I think there's a typo there, right? So um, XML and JSON are very good examples for structured data. Now they could be semi-structured at some point in time, uh, not at all points in time. Um, so they could be loosely structured, that's possible. Uh, but having said that, Industry applications of XML or JSON are always totally structured, standardized data, right? So, um, all right. So, so we we've, we've got two characteristics down. We've got you know large volume of information. It's usually structured and unstructured data, right? The most important aspect here when it comes to big data is that it's business data, right? It's some kind of business data that is relevant to the operation of a particular business. And most importantly, the complexity of the information is what defines big data. Unlike other pieces of information, big data has a certain level of unbridled complexity that is associated with this particular piece of data. That makes it a lot more complicated and a lot more difficult to deal with it compared to you know any other type of data like for example you can actually have databases that are huge in size for example when i used to work for computer associates i used to set up backups and recovery and and uh, clusters for customers who used to have sql or oracle table spaces or exchange databases that used to run into the several hundred gigabytes or sometimes even terabytes in size, right? Now that necessarily does not reflect big data uh, because the complexity of the information is reasonably managed. However, here was a problem, right? At that point in time, way back in 2004 to 2008, when I used to work for Computer Associates as a support engineer, I used to get crash dumps and logs from customers all the time because I was a support engineer. Specifically, I used to be a escalation support engineer. And as an escalation support engineer, all the escalated calls come to me and I have to review all these crash logs and dumps and trace files. And I have to determine what exactly is the complexity, what is the root cause of a particular issue. At that point in time, things used to be very, very, very difficult. Um, we used to have our own dirty ways of managing these problems, managing these things. Uh, one of the classic things that we used to do was, or rather I used to do was that I used to have my own Java applet, uh, which used to take in specific types of log files, process them into columns, extract field information, and then index them as rows and rows of data on a database. So usually I will have the free version 
of SQL Server installed on my local machine. So I'll index that on my free version of SQL Server and then draw some crystal reports from SQL. And finally, when I get an idea as to what the custom problem is and after I resolve the issue, I'll go drop that particular database. Right now, this used to be a very, very time consuming laborious effort. In fact, technicians and managers used to have conflict of interest all the time because managers would want technicians to log on and service as many customer calls as possible. Whereas technicians would want to log off and research and address more complex customer problems as possible. Right. So and the amount of time that we have would be limited in an eight hour shift. And if you understand anything about the technical support organization, it's perhaps the best organization to work for in the IT industry. The reason why I say that is because every other profession will invariably require you to work outside of your standard eight hours of work. It's a technical support profession. That's the only profession that requires you to log in when your shift starts, take your breaks routinely and then log off when your shift ends and you don't have to do anything anymore outside of your shift. You're not responsible for the things that happen outside of your shift, right? So in such a scenario, we used to you know, manage our own levels of complexity with our own applets and our own scripts and uh, some of us who were familiar with Java used to have our own Java applets. Some of us will have Perl scripts. Some other people will have C objective C scripts or C applications or some people would even write stuff in Visual Basic. You know, we used to have our own, you know, dirty little tricks going on that would help us to understand customer log information and trace information. All of this is unstructured data. If a customer emails you a five megabyte attachment in a zip file saying that it is an exchange trace log when you unzip that attachment what's going to happen is that that five megabyte of attachment is going to turn out to be an 800 megabyte exchange trace log for you to open that file on a file editor like textpad would take you invariably six to seven minutes so this is the complexity of big data right so this is exactly where analytics platforms on big data come into the picture. So what exactly does big data analytics provide you as a platform or as a tool? Well, the number one advantage that big data analytics brings to the table is correlations. Right correlations are basically nothing but we try and understand both commonality and causality right in the data and we try to find a bigger picture where one might not be easily visible if you were to manually review all this information think about it right even if your data was structured data right now that structured data if you were going to take that structured data and put that data into something along the lines of let's say microsoft excel Right. Can Microsoft Excel digest structured data? Yes, it can. It's not a very difficult thing to do. Right. You can import CSV files. You can import tab delimited files or space delimited files. Pretty much any of these things if you want to write into Excel. Now, what's the cool thing about uh, Excel is that while you can easily regress and analyze the data, Right, it is impossible for you to deal with large quantities of data. And also, if you've got multiple variability, which makes your data right unstructured, but schematic in nature, it becomes very, very difficult for you to deal all of that kind of complexity in a tool like Microsoft Excel. Right. So what exactly is missing there in Excel? Well, Unfortunately, Excel does not have the capability to do any sort of sophisticated pattern analysis, which any big data analytics platform will allow you to do. Right. Um, so what exactly is the eventual reality out of correlation and pattern analysis? Well, we are able to make predictions. That's one of the most important requirements 
one of the most important features when it comes to big data analytics right so once we are able to make those predictions the again the obvious eventual reality out of that is that we are able to enforce compliance right we're able to completely enforce compliance now people take compliance very lightly again culturally speaking in southeast asian countries compliance as a concept is taken a little lightly compared to how it is taken in the west and you know as a culture as a businesses right off late in the past decade uh, we've come a long way when it comes to addressing compliance but we've still got a lot more work to do and this is an this is a space where big data analytics can hugely improve upon existing infrastructure and existing limitations in that particular infrastructure right so um, has anybody uh, well i'm pretty sure everybody reads news and 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 you're mostly up to date on all of your current affairs does anybody remember any of the regulatory issues that cropped up in india circa 2009 to 2012 uh, especially with all these pharmaceutical companies in india any idea anybody remembers reading up on all the compliance related issues with pharmaceutical companies in india anyone remembers has anyone read up on any of that well you most probably have but maybe you don't remember uh, so if you take just the regulatory aspect of business alone right um without naming names back then i used to work for emc and one of the largest actually not even one of the largest the largest pharmaceutical manufacturing company in india this company was actually subject to so much regulatory restrictions in the us right uh um, not only were they paying a license fee of a million dollars per week to another pharmaceutical company for manufacturing generics uh, specifically paracetamol based generics but they were not able to export about half a ton of paracetamol which was the amount of paracetamol consumption in the united states at that point in time and i'm pretty sure it's more now right all sorts of paracetamol variants right about half a ton of paracetamols uh, paracetamol variants on a monthly basis sometimes even on a biweekly basis right uh, this company couldn't export and they suffered a huge loss uh, worth millions of dollars and unfortunately that company is not around in its current state anymore it's actually been acquired by another company and they're doing very very well right now but at that point in time i was responsible for the entire education the training delivery and the customization of the training material and education consulting work for this pharmaceutical company uh, i happened to travel across pretty much all nooks and corners of the indian subcontinent delivering training to their r and d staff to their plant engineers to their management on all the compliance management systems that they purchased from our company back then right so compliance is a very big issue and today that company actually uses a big data analytics platform they don't use splunk uh, but they use one of our competitors platforms and they are proactively addressing all those compliance issues right uh, even before those issues are brought up uh, before they come into the face of you know regulatory screening right so this is pretty much where big data analytics as a platform stands right these are the use cases for big data analytics so let's look at some industry wide use cases here right let's talk about what are all the common use cases again look these are all the common use cases if i start if if i start mentioning all the use cases for big data i'm going to be mentioning i'm just going to be discussing use cases for the next 3 days right uh, i'd love to do that if you come for a splunk workshop right pay register and work for a splunk workshop we'll do a workshop on what the use cases are and how to sell the platform but that's not our focus today our focus today is in understanding this big data analytics platform how it is positioned and most importantly how you as faculty can position this technology platform to the benefit of your students uh, 
So let's talk about the most important use cases. So in my personal opinion, use cases fall broadly into these four categories. I can sort of, you know, try and muscle my way through and fit all the use cases under one of these platforms, probably multiple of these use cases categories at the same time. So let's talk about a bunch of these use cases, right? The number one use case here is automation. Uh, people are talking about automation a lot today. Um, there's talk about automation taking away jobs. There's talk about automation uh, bringing doom or some kind of a, a downfall or some kind of a doomsday scenario where human beings will no longer be required and all work will be done uh, automated by machines, right? And they'll just be billionaires and you know the middle class will be decimated. Well, while all of that is doomsday scenario, we it, I mean it it we are yet to see whether that is going to be real. I'm pretty sure the people who transition to petrol or whatever gasoline based automobiles from horse carriages also had you know similar apprehensions about how life was going to radically change and life is going to radically change with the advent of automation for sure but if you come to think about it right automation is actually been the reality of human industrial enterprise at least for the past two and a half centuries right so um uh, yeah someone says uh, audio is not uh, available uh, my audio is available let me check my amplifier it's perfect sir. Uh, yeah my yeah my amp my amp is good so i think it's probably a issue on yeah. your end sir. maybe you want to disconnect and reconnect so someone yeah, it is perfect, sir. help that individual Okay, so so if we talk about automation, automation has been right the reality of our human existence at least for the past 250 years, right? Think about it for a moment, patiently, right? Even before the advent of computers becoming mainstream in our homes, when did computers become mainstream in our homes? Well, the rich and affluent people in India were able to buy computers as early as the mid 80s to late 80s, if I'm not too wrong, right? That's how early, you know, computers as a concept were prevalent uh, in India. But forget that for a moment, right? Now, the problem here, right, is this. How do we look at automation from the point of view of big data analytics? Come to think of it, right, big data analytics is not just a field that has influenced computing, specifically modern computing. Big data analytics, or rather data analytics has been the forefront of most automation attempts in the past, at least in the past 50 years, if you come to think about it. The most simplest of the tool would be a calculator. I remember uh, my teachers and my faculties, you know, being very critical of calculators about, you know, 30 years ago when I was in primary school or when I was in middle school, right? Telling us not to use calculators, right? Uh, because calculators aren't going to be available everywhere. Unfortunately, today calculators are literally available everywhere. You can find a calculator on your phone. Like what more do you need? Even if you buy a feature phone, right? Uh, even a feature phone has a calculator today at this point in time, right? So a calculator is a simple example of an automation, right? Instead of you having to do the arithmetic work manually, a machine is able to accomplish that task for you, right? Now, um, let's talk about automation on other fronts, right? Automation has been available in a lot of other fronts. If you come to think of it, I'm pretty sure most of you here are at least from the, uh, if not from the 80s, probably the late 80s to the, uh, the early 90s kind of a generation, right? Many of you would probably be from the, you know, late 60s or 70s as well. If you think about it, in the early 80s, the television sets that were available used to have about eight or 10 or 11 channels. One of those, if you had those 
solid air or dianora or bush tv or whatever it is there used to be a dial that you had to you know uh, that you need to turn for you to change the channel and you only had eight or nine channels and eight or nine channels was too much for you at that point in time because the only available channels were you know you had two channels you had dd1 and dd2 and maybe another regional program channel which was a third channel and you had no other options apart from that but today if you purchase a television your television set comes capable of at least you know 5000 channels but you hardly make use of any of that because you now have a set top box connected where you know channels can be instantly added or subtracted or reduced as per your subscription model right all of this is analytics right using data as the fundamental backbone of automation right what is happening right now in the field of automation is no different from what happened to the you know people in the 80s or in the 90s or in the 2000s or now in the 2010s right so automation is a very important use case big data analytics is perhaps the backbone of any automation if you need to automate something there needs to be data which which basically represents a manual activity and that manual activity is going to be automatically completed by a piece of computer code or some kind of an entity right so that's one field where big data analytics plays a huge role security is another space right if you remember back in the days when computers were you know the the, the advent of computers came in the uh, i think computers in households became famous more and more in the late 90s and early 2000s and if you think about the late 90s and early 2000s most of us used to have windows based computers and with windows based computers we used to have a lot of you know security issues specifically virus and malware issues so we all used to go install not an, not an antivirus or mcafee antivirus or whatever it is right and patches for these antivirus applications would need to be downloaded from the antivirus website on a daily or on a weekly basis a lot of times a new virus or malware will come into the picture infect your computer you'll have to format your entire computer disinfect your entire computer and then clean your data and then put it back after you updated the antivirus software right this is now automated you no longer need to worry if you have antivirus software installed on your machine it automatically connects to a cloud service not only does it update the virus definitions but it also updates the actual software packages the binaries in itself right prediction is another major 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 use case for automation right uh, as well as big data analytics where exactly is prediction going today well how many of you have heard about this uh, this facebook personality this facebook celebrity called tamil nadu weatherman his actual name is john pradeep or something like that anybody heard of this page called tamil nadu weatherman on facebook this person does a lot of weather blogging uh, they usually write about monsoons but they you know this person also write writes about temperatures and you know how summer is going to be how intense it's going to be and all of that stuff so if you actually look at somebody like john pradeep tamil nadu weatherman right a weather blogger who very accurately by the way predicts what the weather is going to be and what kind of you know rainfall monsoon we are going to see the entire plethora of predictions that this person or this blog makes is all on the basis of big data analytics coupled with radar images and satellite images of current happenings so there is data available on what happened in the past when there is a similar scenario and there's data available on what are all the active changes happening right now if you correlate both of that information you get an active prediction the other category of use case for big data analytics here is business process business process is a very very critical area i i am vaguely saying business process here what i actually mean is compliance and regulatory regulatory um, requirements 
right or specifically speaking regulatory compliance right so um here's a story once upon a time i used to um this is another client uh, this is also a very huge uh, pharmaceutical you know company but not in india in in thailand so i used to work for this customer on a education consulting project and this customer um does anybody okay quiz question here does anybody know how long it takes from the point of conception when somebody says let's make a drug using these raw materials or these products or these herbs or these chemicals from that time till the time the drug is actually available in the pharmaceutical shop in the medical shop for you to purchase anybody has any idea how long it takes for drug development i'm talking about generic drugs i'm not talking about i'm not talking about prescription drugs generic drugs okay two to four years is one suggestion anybody else 10 years eight years five years okay all right we've got a plethora of examples here right so i think the closest answer here is actually two to four years so that's how long it takes now this actually used to be a very long affair this actually used to be a 15 year long affair 10 to 15 year long affair and for prescription drugs it still is mostly a 7 to 10 year long affair right but for over the counter drugs right um for otc drugs that do not require a prescription that cycle is now reduced down to two to four years right anybody knows why this cycle came down from 10 to 15 years to two to four years what are the what are the contributing factors for this cycle to come down from 10 to 15 years to two to four years how did that happen globalization automation in research area sample size automation all right so it's a little bit of everything globalization has certainly contributed to it but automation has played a huge role in speeding up this process but it is not just automation alone that has helped the process right what has tremendously helped the process is actually this part this business process this compliance part right here compliance is the most trickiest the most expensive the most dangerous and the most risque aspect of drug product of drug development right of any drug development whether it is going to be generic drugs or whether it's going to be you know uh, indigenous drugs that require a prescription right so what exactly do we mean by you know uh, regulatory compliance well that's nothing but that's the business process aspect of that particular you know business of that particular industry so take for example right you're a pharmaceutical company you research a particular piece of uh, let's say an api you come up with you know a strong clue that this api this particular variant of an api or this particular component might actually be helping some kind of a problem let's say it helps people it helps patients with the patients with a sinus headache relieve their pain relieve their symptoms right so if that is going to be the case you then start drug development you start your r d once you complete your r d you go ahead with your testing so your testing is going to be you know uh, uh, it's basically going to be mass testing and then after your mass testing you'll basically come up with a uh, with a draft version of the product you'll then go in for clinical testing clinical testing will be phase one clinical trial 
phase two clinical trial, phase three clinical trial, sometimes also field trials, which will be phase four trials, although we don't do that anymore, right? Uh, once all of this goes through, we collate the results and then we come up with the math behind the effectiveness of the drug. And we have to go through regulatory approval, get an approval. We have to go through regulatory approval for getting packaging approval. And then we package the drug and then we market that particular drug and then the drug finally goes to the market. Now, in between all these things, there are endless number of regulatory requirements here. All those regulatory requirements will need to be complied with. Right, so here's something that happened right in uh, the uh, in the pharmaceutical company in Thailand that I worked for. So this pharmaceutical company, uh, the factory was also located within the compound where there was a factory that manufactured plastic or rather some intermediary components to making a polyurethane plastic. Right now, the company that owns the polyurethane plant and the pharmaceutical plant was a big, you know, parent company. And to be fair, there was a raw material component or rather an in-process component that was used both for drug production as well as the manufacturing of polyurethane. The biggest difference was that the API that was used for the drug production was a pharmaceutical grade ingredient and the API that was used for the polyurethane production was an industrial grade component, right? So this chemical, right, apparently because it was not labeled because the labeling was different versions. On one version, they followed one numbering system. On another version, they followed another numbering system and the numbering system was confused by the person who was actually loading the units for drug production one day, they actually manufactured the drug with the industrial variant of the chemical instead of using the pharmaceutical variant of the chemical. Now, nothing bad happened, right? The drug did not even go out of the uh, plant, but this error was found out and this error had to be documented and audited. It had to go into the audit report. The external audit from the government regulatory agencies came and they found out this happened. And guess what happened? Um, the director of the business uh, who is actually responsible for the drug development, that director is actually unfortunately spending time in jail. That's what happened. So compliance issues can be very, 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 very serious. And data analytics is an important aspect of making sure that business processes are consistently maintained throughout the production cycle, right? So what I would like to do here is this. I'd like to show you some demos. I've talked about big data analytics. I've talked about you know the use cases for big data analytics. I'd like to show you some demos. I'd like to show you two different demos here. The first demo that I'm going to show you is nothing but I'm going to show you some online sales demo. Right. Um, so what I've got here is I've got some data that belongs to a video game company. Let's say, you know, the, the, the company is some company like Activision, for example, or Nintendo, something like that. So I've got sales data of video games uh, that is being sold through the company's e-commerce website. So I'm going to show you some data manipulation here. I'm going to build some reports and dashboards for me to give you an idea as to how I can actually apply big data analytics uh, on some production grade data for me to, you know, um, uh, come up with very quick results. Uh, before I would like to switch into my server environment and show you some demos, um, I'd like to quickly check with everybody. Uh, does anybody have any questions so far from any of these stuff that we've discussed? Any questions? Participants, if you have any questions, you can post in chat or you can unmute yourself and you can ask.
All right, it appears that there are no questions now, uh, but if you've got any questions, feel free to put them in the chat window. So I'm going to open up my environment here and I'm going to show you some demos of analyzing network data, right? Uh, using Splunk. So if I go into my server environment, what I'm going to do is, sorry, hang on one second here. It looks like I forgot to charge my microphone. So I need to plug this into the battery and uh, sorry, give me one minute. Let me, I'll be right back in a minute. Sorry about that. If I'd ignored that, I'm pretty sure my mic would have been dead. All right, so, um, uh, okay, there's a question on chat. Can you tell me the difference between business intelligence and data science? Uh, well, these are all interchangeable terminologies. The whole point of data science is to actually extract business intelligence from your data. So, uh, terminologies like business intelligence or terminologies like knowledge objects or terminologies uh, such as big data analytics, they're all umbrella terminologies. So you have to understand that what people actually mean by these terminologies is that they are talking about extracting intelligence from information. Information as it is, is not very useful for you. You have to process that information. You have to analyze that information to extract intelligence from that information. Unless and until you do that, right, that piece of data is pretty much as good as not existing, right? So in line with that, business intelligence is simply put the process of extracting knowledge from information. In fact, what I'm actually about to show you is I'm about to show you an example where I'm going to look at some sales data and I'm going to extract some business intelligence from the sales data for me to understand how exactly my sales is going on in my online store. That's what I'm going to do, right? So let me go ahead and uh, Okay, so I am going to run some search queries the search queries that I'm running, they're all going to be run using some type of code. So in my case, I am using the um, uh, I'm using the search processing language that's available in Splunk. So I'm searching an index called web for a particular source type called access combined, which is where all my sales data is. I'm looking, I'm going to look at the data for the last week. Let me look at the previous week worth of sales data here, right? So if I look at the previous week's worth of sales data over here, you see I've got all this sales data available over here, all right? Now, what I am going to do is this. I want to know some information about, you know, what I sold in my organization, right? So I'm going to go ahead and look at uh, the fields that have been extracted. By the way, all of this is e-commerce log data that comes from an Apache Tomcat server. If I actually look at the raw data, you can see that this is all raw data right here. See, this is all raw data right here. This raw data is actually being parsed, right, in Splunk, and I've extracted all this field information. Now, you might wonder, hey, how did you extract all this field information? Well, I extracted this field information using a piece of technology that has been around literally from our father's times. So it doesn't matter even if you are 50, right? I'm sure it's been around even from your father's times, right? Uh, actually, it's not even five decades. I'm, I'm pretty sure this, this piece of technology has been around for at least six to seven decades in some rudimentary form or the other. So the technology that I'm talking about is very, very simple. It's a text matching technology. It's called regex or regular expressions. 
all I've done here is I've made use of regular expressions to extract all this field information from the you know log data here. In my case, this e-commerce log data. Right. So what I've done here is I've got all this field. There are so many different types of customer actions. I am only interested in purchase actions. So I'm going to say action equals to purchase, and I'm going to look at only the purchase events here. So that's about 24,461 events in the past week. Now, I am also interested only in successful purchases. So what will I do? I have a status field here. Now, the success code for HTTP status is 200, right? So I'll say status equals to 200. And look, I've gone ahead and I've said status equals to 200. And I have got, you know, only the successful purchases related events here. Now that I've got all this information, it's very easy for me to figure out how the sales is going on. So I've got a lot of different products over here. So all that I'm going to do is I'm going to draw um, a chart command and I'm going to say sum of price. I'm going to count all the price. I've got a price field here, which is the price of the product, right? As total revenue. So I'm going to calculate total revenue by product name as product name. So a simple piece of code here, actually, I don't think I can do the as field here. So a simple piece of code here, all that it has done is that it has given me a beautiful table, right, consisting of the actual product name and the total revenue that I have made. Now I can cosmetically clean up this and I can say rename the product underscore name field as product name. And then I can sort it as well uh, by making use of the total revenue field. There you go. I've so I'm sorting it from the topmost revenue to the bottom most revenue in the past week. Here's what I can do. I can go to visualization and I can even put a column chart or a bar chart or my favorite is I'll put a pie chart. I'll represent what is the revenue in terms of sales in the format section. I can also go ahead and uh, you know uh, turn on the values over here if I wanted to uh, or if I like this better what I could do is I could instead of a pie chart I could just go ahead and use of uh, sorry uh, of um, bar chart that might be a good idea. So I can also show all of my data values here what these data values are so I can look at this in multi series mode if I want to so I can put the legend at the bottom here and there you go. I've got a beautiful report here that now tells me what's the total revenue for each and every product here. So the product names are highlighted here. I can go save this as a report and I can say uh, revenue by product last week. And uh, I'll just save this report. I can add it to a dashboard. I'll call it a new dashboard. Um, okay. Um, looks like I cannot write dashboards here for this uh, app. Not a problem. I'll uh, let me copy this, go to another app, and I can easily write dashboards in that app. Revenue, oops, revenue by product last week and save that add it to a dashboard i'll add it to a new dashboard i'll call it online sales monitoring and i'll put this as a report and save it and look i can now go take a look at this dashboard as well right and 
this dashboard is now available in a table format. If I don't like the table format, if I want a visualization here, you know, I can select a visualization. Nobody is stopping me from doing it. See, now I have a visualization. So that's the power of data science. If you were to do this in Excel, you're going to have to regress all this data and first you'll have to convert this unstructured data into structured data and then you've got 24,000 events. You're going to have to import that into Excel. You're going to have to format all of it. You're going to have to sort all of that data and then you're going to have to column wise filter maybe come up with a pivot table and then come up with a visualization on top of the pivot table and finally refine that data, right? The amount of effort that it would have taken for you to do this in a tool like, for example, Microsoft Excel, right? Would have been half a day's worth of work. Here, in a big data analytics platform, you took roughly about two to three minutes. That's all you took, right? So let's go ahead and explore more here, right? We're going to go ahead and we're going to look at the same kind of data, right? We're going to look at the online sales data here. And in the online sales, I want to look at some more information. So what I want to do is this. I want to go ahead and I want to, um, what can I do here? Can I, all right. I want to know the kind of sales that's been happening every eight hours because I have, you know, employee shifts. Sales employees are working in 24 hour shifts on my online website, right? So I want to know by employee shift how the sales is going to be. So how do I do that? Well, I'll use the same piece of data, underlying data, and I'll say time chart, sum of. Uh, price as revenue and this time I want to look at this by product category so I'll say category ID and I'll look at the previous week's worth of data here so look this is what I've got uh, what I'll do here is I'll say span let me enlarge this so you can see it better span equals to eight hours so that this data will only span for eight hours. Um, oops. So there you go. I've got eight hours spanned data right here. So I can go to visualization and unfortunately column chart or even bar chart here is not going to cut it. Uh, the visualization is going to be ugly. So instead I'll choose a line chart which will represent beautifully represent the data here. See. So I can go and save this report, right? I can say um, sales by sales shift wise by category last week, right? Save this and I'll add this to the same dashboard as the online sales monitoring and save it. And there you go. Now I can go take a look at that dashboard. And this dashboard now has two beautiful reports. One is revenue by product. And the other one is sales, uh, which is shift wise. So every point here is a shift. This is one eight hour shift, next shift, next shift, the next shift, the next one, next one. I mean, I can change this if I want to. Instead of having shift wise sales, what if I want to have hourly sales here? Can I do that? Yes, I can. I just need to say span equals to one hour and run the search. And now I've got hourly sales. I'll just need to save the report here, right? And I'll just hit save. And once I save the report, that report would have also been updated into the dashboard. So look here, I now have hourly sales, right? So I can slice and dice this data in any way I want to. I have absolutely no problems at all. I can manipulate this data in whatever way I want to. Right now, another cool thing that I can do here is that I can also go ahead 
and I can arrive at some interesting, um, let's say, for example, comparisons. Now, I am selling my video games both online and offline. So I'm selling it through my e-commerce website. But what if I also sell it through a network of third party stores? Remember, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you could actually go buy music cassettes and music CDs in a shop. Like, for example, um, if you, you know, lived in a, a first tier or second tier city in anywhere in the country, you could go to a bookstore like Landmark or you could go to like a music shop like Music World in Chennai or Bangalore or Coimbatore or whatever it is, right? And you could go buy a music CD or a music cassette or a DVD, something like that. You could do the same thing online as well. You could also order it online on, you know, a Flipkart or something like that, right? So those were the options that were available to you back then. Or you could go to the AVM, whatever website, and you can order it online as well, and you can go pick it up from the shop later. So what if I want to compare the sales between my online sales and my offline sales here? Is there a way for me to do that? Yes, I can actually. Uh, what I am going to do is I'm going to say, uh, I have another piece of data uh, called sales index, which is where I store my store sales. And I'll say vendor sales. Let me look at the sales for the past week as well, right? So this is all my vendor sales. This is all my manual vendor sales. Now, this part right here, this one right here is my online sales. This is all my online sales in the past week. I want to compare this sales and that sales. So how do I do that? Well, I can just do like a small jiggle bandhi between these two sales and I can jumble these things up, right? The world of data analytics is pretty straightforward. I'll just say an or condition and then I'll put these two sales within programmatic brackets and there you go. I now have sales results combined from both the online sales and the offline sales. So all I have to do right now is just manipulate this by a time chart command and then just go ahead and say span equals to one hour and then count by source type. Source type is the categorization system I have in Splunk, which tells me what kind of, you know, uh, category I'm looking at. So this is the sales here. I can go to visualization and let me rename this rename access combined as online sales. And then I'll rename the uh, uh, vendor sales as um, shop retail sales. So there you go. I've got online sales and I've got retail sales. The cool thing is that the visualization here allows me to visualize this in whatever way I want to. Instead of a line chart, I can put an area chart and I can also do a chart overlay. I can overlay the retail game sales. So if I go to chart overlay, I can overlay retail sales over online sales so I can comparatively analyze every time I have a particular online sales, I can see retail sales is you know, probably one third is that of online sales. That's what is happening. So there you go. I can go save this as a new report. So I can say online versus retail sales last week. Right. And I can save this. I can add it to the existing dashboard here. Right and I can go take a look at that particular information. See, this is my, now my online versus retail sales. Now, what if I want to find out the sales uh, by geographic location? What if so many people from around the world are actually buying my, uh, my products, right? Uh, what if I want to see category-wise sales uh, across the world? Uh, is that possible? Can I do that? Of course I can do that. Why not? Right? Uh, let me show you. Um, uh, now for this, um, any big data analytics platform will allow you to make use of some kind of a map-based visualization. Uh, Splunk has some excellent map-based visualization. 
so i'm going to search for some data here now my problem here is that my online sales does not have the data that i need for me to draw a map now quiz question what kind of data do you need in order for you to draw a map what information do you need to draw a map if i want to plot sales in a map location right what information do i need to plot a sales on a map i mean what information do you need to plot anything on a map forget sales you want to plot something on a map what information do you need longitude and latitude longitude and latitude excellent answer that is what i was looking out for if you want to plot anything on a map you need to know the latitude and longitude location right basic middle school science right middle school geography right well guess what middle school geography is still useful in the world of big data analytics and machine learning in fact most of the things that you'll apply in the world of data analytics and machine learning will actually be your middle school geography and middle school mathematics and middle school biology that's all you'll apply now i have a unique headache here my data is lousy my data does not have latitude and longitude location here do you see any latitude longitude fields here you don't it's all missing well no problem any good big data analytics software will be able to identify latitude and longitude information from an ip address field i have an ip address field called client ip which is the ip address of the customer who is buying the product online so from this i have now extracted the longitude latitude region um city country all this information i have now extracted see now i will just pipe this to a map command so in splunk i have a geostats map command i'll say count by client ip of course i won't get results because i have fat fingers and i've made a typo there you go see now i've got a map wise plot of what kind of sales i have see that so i can go save this as a report world wide online sales last week and save this add it to a dashboard and now the cool thing here with this dashboard is i can just you know make this dance to my tunes for example i can put you know similar pieces of data across each other and then i can put the map based visualization here now look see i've got a beautiful dashboard here in a matter of 15 minutes well sorry not 15 in a matter of 17 minutes since i started i have built a comprehensive corporate online sales dashboard right this is the power of big data analytics this is what you can do with big data analytics if you were to traditionally do this with any traditional data processing application software if you were to do this with sql or excel or oracle or if you were to do this manually programmatically by writing an application you know in objective c or java or whatever uh, it'll range anywhere between a few days to a few weeks worth of effort but because we are dealing with big data and because we already have analytics tools available to us it was super easy for us to build this entire report out of the box without any customizations without writing a single line of code all that we wrote was some search queries right in splunk and we just built this corporate dashboard for online sales that's what we've done yeah so that's my first demo an online sales demo any questions before i move into my next demo
Arjun, do you have any queries? Yeah, sir, is this Splunk tool is available free for us to practice? Yep, you can go to www.splunk.com and you can download a free version of Splunk. You get 500 megabytes of indexing capacity per day. You can't do some comprehensive things like you can't set up a cluster. You can't set up a distributed search. You can't set up a failover. Those kind of things you can't do. But everything that I just showed you, you can do by making use of mock data. Just just come up with your own mock data. In fact, if you want to come up with mock data, we have an app for that as well. It's called Event Gen. So you can install the Event Gen app, configure it, and you can come up with some fake data as well. Uh, question, what is the difference between Splunk and Tableau? Uh, it's the difference between Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Thumbs Up. So if you can tell me the difference between those, uh, the, the difference between Splunk and Tableau and every other piece of data analytics software is pretty much the same. Um, again, I work for Splunk. So obviously, if I say anything, it's pretty much going to be biased towards Splunk. Nevertheless, because you asked the question, I'm obliged to answer it. The fundamental difference between Splunk and Tableau is that onboarding data and handling data in Splunk is a lot easier compared to Tableau. That is from what I know. Um, I'm sure people will disagree with me, but one of the reasons why Splunk is so easy and so popular and so successful compared to Tableau, um, the reason why we are a $7 billion company and the Tableau business is not, is simply because Splunk is easier, faster, and effective to onboard that data and present that data quickly. Whatever I did right now in Splunk in a matter of 17 minutes, I can guarantee you, you won't be able to do it in Tableau. It might take a little longer for you to do, for you to get to where I got. Do we have some open framework for big data? Um, there's plenty of open framework for big data. I mean, there's Hadoop, there's Elasticsearch. Uh, much of the Splunk components themselves are actually, you know, uh, open source uh, code. Uh, we've, we're not doing anything fantastic. There isn't much proprietary code in here. Um, all that I have here is just basically, you know, um, just open source components like regular expressions and simple XML extensions and Node.js and React.js and all that kind of stuff. Right, so I'm going to start off with demo two. Uh, we've already reached 70 minutes here, so I'm going to take quick five minutes to show you another demo here. Uh, I'm going to analyze my corporate network and I'm going to look at some misbehaving employees. All right, so that's going to be my next demo here. So let me go back to search here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my corporate network. So for looking at my corporate network, I'm going to go ahead and say index equals to network source type equals to Cisco WSA squid. This is the Cisco network switch data I have. So I'll look at this over the past 30 days because I want one month's worth of data. Actually, let me say previous month. Now, if you look, there are so many different actions here, right? Uh, I'm not worried about any of that. I am actually worried about a field called usage. So this is the customer, uh, you know, the, the corporate usage. So I can basically say, you know, top values by time and look without even writing code. I just came up with the top values by time. If I look at the statistics, this is what I have and I can go to the line chart. Let me just say hourly interval here. That'll be better. Ooh, hourly interval is bad. <laughs> Let me take an eight hour shifted interval here. Okay, that's better. So as you can see, personal usage is what is I think the highest here in this company looks like nobody's actually working in this company. Anyways, again, I can save this as a report. I can say, for example, um, corporate network usage in the last month. Right, so I'll just save this. 
I'll create a new dashboard. I'll call it corporate network analysis. That's the name of the dashboard. I'll save this report here and that's it. Right now. What I can do is I can also go ahead and analyze other pieces of information as well. I'm pretty sure I have, for example, uh, source type is Cisco. Uh, I probably have a firewall data as well over here. See, I've got firewall data here. So I can get all this firewall information. So I've got duration information about firewall. I've got IP address. I've got location, right? So I can see what are all the top events here, right? By firewall, right? So I can go ahead and say, for example, um, top values. Top values will give me the top, you know, five username. I can also go ahead and say, for example, rare, which will basically give me the least used username so instead of bar chart here look these are all the rare users so i can slice the data by that way as well what i could also do is these are all the you know workstations right so i can go ahead and look at the top values by workstation these are all the departments that are accessing the network so i can simply say top values to see which department is accessing the company firewall the most so I can go put up a you know pie chart here, see, and then save a report. Depart department based usage of firewall. That's going to be in the last month. Right? Save that. And I can add it to the corporate network analysis dashboard. And there you go. We've got that dashboard here with us. See, that's the corporate network usage dashboard. Right, what else can I do here uh, with this particular? Um, I can also look at the content type wise usage as well. So different types of content, you know, can be used in the network. So let me go back to Cisco WSA squid here right let me refresh this search so you know i've got the previous month's worth of data over here and look i've got you know some http content type here so i can basically look at the http content type so i can just run statistical analysis as well i have access to things like the stats command right stats count by http content type see that's the http content type this is all the http content type over here i've got information now what i can do is i can also parse the information that i've got as well right i can evaluate the type equals to and I can use an if condition syntax, HTTP, ooh, 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 sorry, open bracket, HTTP content type, like, um, I just want to know the image like content type, right? Or I want to know, like for example, the graphic like content type, or I want, other types of content usage. So I just want to know what exactly is the type of usage for this kind, you know, for this kind of uh, content type. And I could just go ahead and uh, limit the content type to uh, to these kind uh, of content. So uh, that's the type results that I've got. And then I'll just sum it up stats sum of count as total by type. So that's the different type. I can go to visualization, put a pie chart. See, this is the graphic type. 
and the other types of data and I can build a report and say, you know, data consumption types in the corporate network last month. So here again, I can save this. I can add it to the dashboard. I'm pretty sure the dashboard is going to neatly display the data that we are interested in, right? So that's what we can do. Um, what else we can do here? Let me think what kind of data we have here. What other kind of data we have here? Mm. Okay, um, I can also look at some server failures as well. So let me look at some server failures. So that data should be there in a security index, not in the network index. Index equals to security. Source type is Linux secure. Um, and then invalid. Password or fail. So this is all the password failure in the past month, invalid password failures, something like that. So, you know, I can even see which user has, you know, the most password failures. I can just say top values, right? And I can see the users that have the most number of failures. Instead of top 20, I'll just say top 10 because I want to know who the top 10 culprits are here. See, those are the top 10 password failures in the past month. So uh, top 10 failed passwords last month, right? So I'll just go ahead and sort of create another dashboard here and this dashboard I'll edit it and I'll drag these two items side by side and I'll also drag those two items side by side and there you go so this is my corporate network analysis dashboard and then this is my online sales monitoring dashboard. So like I said, in the matter of how long has it been since I started? 22 minutes since I started. In 22 minutes, I've built a comprehensive online sales monitoring dashboard as well as a corporate network analysis dashboard. That's demo number two. So what kind of job opportunities are we potentially looking at in the field of data science? Well, when it comes to data science or big data analytics, right, interchangeable terminologies, let's not get stuck up on terminologies. There's a lot of, you know, quality work, the, the era of quantity work, the era of hourly billing is gone in my personal opinion. Um, so there is a lot of quality work to be done. The focus is always going to be on niche markets. So mathematics has heavy influence. So I think if students have an opportunity to opt for elective papers um, as faculties, if you want to groom your students to go towards data science or big data analytics or machine learning or AI kind of fields, uh, you should certainly groom your students towards adopting uh, more math skill sets, specifically more statistics skill sets, right? So statistics and arithmetic skill sets. Uh, there's a lot of logic and reasoning that is required uh, when it comes to the analysis of data. So you need to understand the data that you're working with comprehensively so that you're able to take logical uh, reason decisions, right? Critical thinking skills are very important. So anything that you can help to groom these skills are all quintessentially useful uh, to the academia if you want to exploit this particular market and if you want to 
you know take advantage of the opportunities that are currently available and the ones that are coming up in the near and immediate future so it's 3 30 right now so i'm going to wrap up today's session and i'm going to open this session for questions and answers if you um a question is it possible to identify the publications of particular person well if the data is available on the internet i'm pretty sure you can crawl the internet and you can index the relevant data and it's a matter of you searching and building a data model for you to find out you know um what are the publications that you're interested in and and where exactly is the source so it depends upon where the data is so if the data is openly accessible and if it's in a binary textual format it's very easy to find out uh, if it's in some other format then you're going to have to solve the technical problem of extracting the data first before you could analyze it all right well uh, thanks for the opportunity to discuss big data analytics if you've got any questions uh, please feel free to send me an email um, i'm more than happy to answer questions um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Thank you.